Hello, everyone, and welcome. I see that we have our audience joining us today here via Zoom. We are very excited to have a very dynamic conversation today, and we will have a little bit of a housekeeping and some rules ahead of time to make sure that we are utilizing our time as best as possible, and then a few reminders before we dive into the bios and uh, straight into the panel questions to maximize our time today. My name is Savannah Lane. I am the Executive Director of the Turkish Heritage Organization, and we are an organization that is founded to continue to foster the conversation surrounding the U.S.-Turkey relationship, uh, the bilateral alliance, as well as the NATO alliance. And today we are very excited to focus on a conversation topic that I think many are focused on right now, which is foreign policy under the Biden administration, any changes, any challenges that we may be seeing. Of course, there is a lot that is happening in the world right now, so it's going to be impossible to cover all of it. But we have some stellar panelists with us today who are going to be covering as much as we can. A few reminders for our audience joining us today. This conversation will be recorded, so you can visit this conversation after it is completed and loaded onto our website at www.turkheritage.org. And please, while you're there, also visit our events page for upcoming events. We have a very exciting event next week featuring Alparslan Bayraktar and a few other uh, directors and former deputy uh, director for some energy organizations here in the U.S. to discuss the future of global energy. Energy. So uh, a very interesting topic there as well. And finally, I want to say thank you to our team members who have helped put on this event behind the scenes that are on the call right now. Thank you for your diligent work. And of course, thank you to our audience for joining us today. This conversation is going to be dynamic. So we want to incorporate audience questions. And with that being said, I want to encourage you during our conversation, please put your audience questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box so that we can go ahead and get started and we have Ambassador Freed joining us here. Welcome Ambassador Freed. We have just been doing introductions. You have not missed a thing. So with that being said, I want to maximize our time because we have some amazing panelists here. So I'm going to dive into the bios. We're going to do a panel session and then of course, as I mentioned, we'll leave time for audience questions to the best of our ability to incorporate your thoughts and conversation throughout today's webinar. So with that, I would like to introduce Ambassador Daniel Freed, who is a fellow at the Atlantic Council, served for over 40 years in various distinguished capacities in the U.S. Department of State. Notable positions include Ambassador to Poland from 1997 to 2000, Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, and Principal Deputy Special Advisor to the Secretary of State for the new independent states. That's a mouthful, but very amazing accomplishments there. He also served as the State Department's coordinator for sanctions uh, policy and as a senior director for Central and Eastern Europe in the National Security Council. Ambassador Freed, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Merhaba. And we also have another wonderful guest here, General Philip Breedlove. He is a highly decorated retired Air Force General, served as the 17th Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, Allied Command Operations in Europe, during which he led the most comprehensive structural and policy security changes in NATO's history. He was commander of the U.S. European Command and commander of U.S. Air Forces Europe and Air Forces Africa, and served as Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force and as Assistant Chief of Staff for Air Force Operations, Plans, and Requirements. He currently serves as a Chair of the Middle East Institute's Frontier European Initiative. We are very excited to hear more on that throughout this conversation today. So General Breedlove, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have a very exciting dynamic perspective from Professor Mustafa Aydin, who is Professor of International Relations at Kadir Haas University, as well as the President of the International Relations Council of Turkey. His leadership positions include serving on the governing boards of OECD Higher Education Program and the World Council for Middle Eastern Studies, co-coordinating co the Greek-Turkish Forum and acting as member of the European Academy of Sciences and the Arts, the Global Relations Forum, and the Turkish Atlantic. Atlantic Council. Again, I could have gone on about all of these panelists and we'd be here all day, but I want to dive right into the question. So I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. And Ambassador Freed, I'm going to put you on the spot here and see if we can start with you. Uh, throughout this conversation, we're going to have a lot of different perspectives, but uh, you know, President Biden has committed his strengthening of, of ties to uh, really strengthen the ties between the United States and Europe throughout the campaign trail, uh, throughout the beginning days of his administration 
generation. So in your opinion, what will some of these key issues be and the positions that we may be looking for for President Biden to really strengthen those ties and in incorporate more of a U.S.-European partnership? Well, you don't need to listen to me. Um, just take a read or a listen of President Biden's speech at the Munich Security Conference. That was a pretty clear speech. He made clear that the United States wants to work with its allies, starting with Europe, but also including key democracies around the world, to work with democratic allies to deal with both aggressive authoritarians, that would be Putin, in a very different context, that would be China, but different because they are not as confrontational as solely, con purely confrontational as Putin seems to be. And the United States doesn't expect allies to salute and fall in line. This is more of a partners in leadership, a partnership. And Biden was very clear about that. And he, this is not the first time. He has a long track record of support for America's allies and alliances. Um, remember, he came of age during the administration of John F. Kennedy. He, this stuff is in his bones. And though your know, General Breedlove and I at worked with Vice President Biden and with Senator Biden, he is the most pro-European American president since George H.W. Bush. And he very much represents the bipartisan what used to be the bipartisan consensus that the United States needs to take responsibility for the world or we're going to get bit and bit hard. Um, there's a lot more to say, but, that, but that's a start. This is a strong internationalist foreign policy, and they have pushed back on attacks from the nationalist and isolationist right and the left, which is quieter in the U.S., but it's there. I mean, the hard left that doesn't believe America, that believes America is too wicked to lead. But this is, this is a, a good moment, though there is a tremendous amount of work and challenges ahead. And one speech, one great speech doesn't mean the problems are solved. Thank you, Ambassador. You bring up a lot of key issues there. Obviously, the unique uh, definition now of what we would even define as, as bipartisan, uh, but certainly I think in this conversation, we all can agree the importance of continued collaboration uh, internationally, of course, as well with the U U.S. and European collaboration is important. Uh, now, General Breedlove, I want to turn to you and kind of shift gears a little bit. Uh, you know, in light of President Biden's decision to pause the withdrawal of troops, uh, U.S. troops, that is, from Germany, what kind of message do you you think that this sends uh, to U.S. allies both within NATO and elsewhere of kind of the potential shifts that we may see in the Biden administration? So I think Dan got us off to a great start on this answer, frankly. The president was clear in his speech and, and then our Minister of Defense, our Secretary of Defense, Secretary Austin, in his first speech at the Death Men's at NATO had a, a very clear message as well, which underpinned what the president said. They both were extremely straightforward on the value of allies, the value of alliances, and, and very clearly at the Mendes by Secretary Austin, the value of NATO. And so I think that in that framework, it makes sense that we would pause and reconsider any changes in our positions in Europe. Um, I will offer my opinion, and it hasn't changed, and I've said it many times, we don't need less troops in Europe. Uh, we're all clear that we probably will not have more permanent troops in Europe, but we need to continue to consider how we improve our rapid power projection into Europe, and that requires some troops on the ground and infrastructure on the ground. And, and I believe we heard a healthy uh, approach by Secretary Austin about the continued need for improvement in European readiness, uh, their own investment in their own capability. So uh, I'm very encouraged. I think we'll take a clear-eyed look at what we need in Europe. 
and we'll come to the right answer. And I echo much of what Dan said. I think that the track record of the group of people that are working with and for the president uh, on Europe is pretty clear. And I think that uh, we can expect now a smooth movement uh, to a, a good union again across the Atlantic. Thank you, General. Now, certainly there are going to be challenges and it's not just stemming from the obvious challenge that we are facing right now with the coronavirus. Uh, but Professor, I wanna to turn to you and kind of direct some criticism that, or, or I should say worries that people have had in, in the shift of uh, Biden administration in that there's obviously uh, an increased uh, focus on in international alliances and collaboration, but many believe that the Biden administration may be troubled for the U.S.-Turkey relationship. Is there a signal of possibility for a reset in bilateral ties, or is it going to be a continued rockiness that we see on the horizon? Well, I think uh, the analysis and expectations so far are mixed. Uh, it starts with a horror analysis, uh, expectations, then turned into optimism, and now it looks like more realism setting in. Uh, we are just uh, a month into the presidency, so, and there, is, there hasn't been any single uh, in-depth discussion yet uh, about the issues that Turkey and the United States are facing in their relationship. However, hearing from the United States presidents that uh, he will value the relationship with its allies and bring in the diplomacy and rely more on diplomacy is always good to hear, at least somebody like myself who has a great trust on diplomacy and ability of the diplomats to change the, uh, change the direction that Turkish-American relations are going in the last few years. Uh, when I say few years, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a few years now. Uh, improving relations with the European allies and NATO is important because for Turkey also that's very important and uh, it's a kind of a, a underlying connection between United States and Turkey. And also uh, having institutional connections which diplomacy would bring most probably, uh, comparing previously where we only had a president, president to president talks, uh, we will have more predictability and less uncertainty uh, uh, in the future of uh, Turkish-American relations. However, whether this will usher in a good days it's remained to be seen because the bedrock of that institutionalization for Turkish-American relations uh, had been a military to military and diplomacy to diplomacy connection, uh, where since the second Obama administration, we seem to be having some problems both in Pentagon and the State Department. So the value of diplomacy coming back uh, will depend on uh, how much and whether Turkey could really develop connections into the State Department and, and Pentagon as well. Certainly. Well, I think, you know, you bring up a great point in that it has to go much deeper than just a president to president connection, which is the unique relationship that we saw between President Trump and President Erdogan. So, uh, as you mentioned, you know, we're a month in time will tell uh, what to expect, but uh, certainly we hope that increased collaboration and diplomacy is is on the horizon. Now, Ambassador Freed, you know, speaking of uh, continued collaboration, we heard a lot of uh, campaign rhetoric during the, the Biden campaign run in, in 2020 calling on NATO nations to really reaffirm their commitment to democracy as a union of, of democratic nations. Uh, we've also heard time and time again international criticism, not just from President Trump, but from many others who are critical of the direction or uh, abilities that NATO has in today's modern age. So first, I want to ask a little bit more about uh, what it means for NATO to enforce more democratic values for countries that some some may say are leaning away from that, and further, what it means to really reevaluate NATO in the 21st century modern age with all the threats and worries that uh, comes along with that. Oh, wow. There is a lot packed into that question, and it's a, it sounds simple, but it's serious. You've asked a serious question. Let me try to unpack it and then and Phil Breedlove can clean up the mess I'm about to make. NATO 
was established to defend democracy against, a, one of its purpose was defend democracy against Soviet aggression. But it was never an alliance with just democracies in it. Turkey was not a democracy for, mo you know, for most of the decades up until you know, the, the first 50 years of NATO's existence. Neither was Greece for a long time. Neither was Portugal for a while. Okay, so let's be straightforward about this. But democracy was always, defense of democracy was always NATO's purpose. Now, I, okay, full disclosure, I was in the Bush administration when President Erdogan, well, when the AK party won the elections. And I remember the tremendous hope that we had. And I remember what the AK party told us was that they were going to deepen Turkish democracy by getting away from a very thin and, you know, un a, a, a thin crust of Turkish elites that were running the country. And they set out to modernize the economy and they had a policy, I remember Davut Tolu expressing it, zero problems with neighbors. And they got a lot done. I mean, the Turkish economy really flourished. And Erdogan made a case, and Abdullah Gul and others like Babajan made the case that they were deepening Turkish democracy, and we should look at the AK party as a kind of Muslim version of Christian democratic parties in Europe. And now, this is what I heard from them a lot. It didn't work out that way. And the problems in US-Turkish relations now are not only from the Turkish side. I mean, we made mistakes. You want me to mention one? I don't think, and I will. I don't think that the Obama administration's reaction to the attempted coup in Turkey was as firm enough or as swift enough as it should have been, okay? I, so it's not all one-sided, but, but having said that, a lot of the Turkish political class used the United States as a punching bag. I mean, for years. And a lot of the moves have been in an authoritarian direction. How many people were arrested? How many journalists sacked? How many, you know, this, everybody, I suspect people listening know a lot more about the details than I do. So it's a tough question. You know, if you read some of the things that senior people coming into the Biden administration wrote, they want to use NATO to, to push a democracy agenda. I don't know what that means. It's not easy. This is not simple stuff. And the arguments for Turkey as an ally are strong, but the concerns about Turkish democracy are equally strong. And you notice I've described the problem and I haven't come to a solution because I don't have one in my own mind. I do, you know, I, there are a lot of people in Washington who have years of investment in a good, in the, the alliance with Turkey and a lot of affection for Turkey. That's the US military, but not just the US military. It's US civilians and a lot of them, you know, diplomats. A reset, you know, it may be possible. I hope so, but it will require efforts from the Turkish government. And, you know, things like buying major weapons from Russia. Like, seriously? And is zero problems with neighbors? Well, what does, does it mean zero problems with neighbors? It looks more like problems with all the neighbors. We both have work to do. It's not just one-sided. Now, I've gone on at length, but boy, I, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. It certainly yeah. is. And yeah. if I may, I want to push you a little bit more. You know, there, there's no doubt that there are, there are you know, issues on, on both sides. I think that there's no question about the uh, rocky relationship and, and the history that uh, has to be acknowledged. Do you think that it's possible through NATO, though, if you were leaning more towards a, a more stricter, let's say, enforcement of the NATO democratic values, how does that play into the reset? Is that going to cause more problems than not? Or is there a potential for optimism here? I really want to hear from Phil Breedlove, but I have reservations 
sure. about using NATO to, to push a democracy agenda in a transactional sense. I think we should, the United States should speak out about democracy as a value and we should maintain relations with Turks who agree. Certainly. And strong ones and mean it and be visible in doing so, even if some Turks in the government don't like it. But turning on, does that mean turning on and off Article 5 or US Turkish military cooperation on and off? I, I, I'm a civilian. I'm not responsible for the military relations, but I just can't, I can't think of how I would write that in a policy paper for Tony Blinken or, or you know, the National Security Advisor. Mm -hmm. I just can't see how I would do that. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a democracy agenda or, or we don't mean it. You have to be smart enough to do both. So the, you know, what would be my, if I were in one, my old job at the NSC, what's my memo to Jake Sullivan look like about Turkish relations? And it means a democracy agenda mm -hmm. and reaching out to Turkish society. And, and Professor Aydin is gonna just, you know, rip me to shreds and point out all the holes in my logic. And that's okay. A strong democracy agenda alongside a military to military agenda and a security agenda and and pushing the Turks to actually recognize that NATO does a lot for them. Look, I, there are other people who have wisdom and on this call and I would I want to hear from I want to hear the advice of Turkish friends also Certainly. and not make up a policy in the blind. Certainly. Well, I, I think you've given us a lot of food for thought here, and I do want to turn it to General Breedlove because I want him to kind of pick up uh, and continue thoughts here. And also, uh, thank you for what you've shared thus far. So General Breedlove, I want to give you time, and of course, Professor Yu as well, because we want to have this dynamic conversation. But General Breedlove, any thoughts as we've just discussed in terms of NATO in general, this commitment to more democratic values, how this plays out, of course, in the U.S.-Turkey relationship, but also, you know, some of the, I want to add in another element here, what can be some of the things that the Biden administration can do to maintain momentum, not only obviously with continued work towards the U.S.-Turkey relationship, but something that you had mentioned in a recent article in a continued presence needed in Eastern European, continued support for strategic allies. So let's add in one more layer to this conversation and see what is the momentum that we can continue to build on outside of just U.S.-Turkey relations in, in the guise of the NATO alliance. But as a whole in terms of increased collaboration and partnership? So let me just pile on to Dan's remarks first, because uh, when it comes to how, what he talked about using NATO as a tool or maybe a bludgeon or whatever to try to force these democratic values, I'm in violent agreement with Dan. This is not what NATO is about. Um, but let me tell you that across time, we have seen NATO do those things. I remember my first summit uh, where uh, uh, the president and others were before and around meetings, meeting with small groups of people to work on. We had a couple of nations that were in a recalcitrant way when it comes to, to democracies at the time. And in small asides, groups of leaders from nations, Ms. Merkel, Mr. Holland, and others were and our president were working these very issues, but it wasn't a structural thing of NATO to start enforcing democracy because may I just say that democracy takes many forms and, and we've seen some really interesting forms right here in our own country. And so um, I, I just believe that, uh, I, I know this is gonna open a whole can of worms, but I always like to talk about our values and what we saw uh, in our alliance that, that held us together. People all too often focus about the things that divide us. If we start the conversation with what we agree on and what holds us together, it allows us to move, I think, easy, more easily into the things we need to address that are problematic. I know that sounds altruistic, but it works for me. And Dan mentioned it a couple of times, when I was having problems in a military sense, I first started off with the things that we absolutely agreed on. 
and then built from that to address the things that were uh, causing us issues. As to your second question, um, there's a lot of mechanical things that we can do. Um, I, you, uh, Dan and others will testify, I remain apolitical. I don't like to be associated with either party. Uh, I am all about trying to find an American solution and an American way forward that is bipartisan. And so I'm not going to celebrate or anything, but we did make some gains in the last four years in the Black Sea region. Uh, and we, we made some presence gains and we established some new relationships. Um, and I think we should continue to build on them, frankly. And I think this is a perfect place to maybe ask Turkey to lead and help us find a way to cooperate together to bring our alliance a little closer in this region. We, the United States, have made big inputs to presence in the Black Sea region. We just announced uh, a rotational persistent presence of, of Reapers, MQ-9s. We, of course, stationed four destroyers in Maron, Spain, in order to keep a destroyer in the Eastern Med in the Black Sea all the time. And so we, the US, have made some pretty strong commitments. And the good news is several of our allies have followed with us and we see their increased presence in the region as well. Uh, air policing in Romania, et cetera, et cetera. But wouldn't it be great if maybe the Turkish Navy led a new standing naval group that was primarily composed of NATO members with US presence as a NATO member occasionally, but a more NATO flavored standing naval group in the Black Sea to show NATO's commitment to this region and Turkish leadership in this effort. I think it would be a great thing. And I, I think that uh, along the way, we then as the US would find it easier to increase our participation in more locally, regionally led enterprises that demonstrate uh, NATO uh, commitment to the region. Thank you, General Breedlove. I think this is really important to not only touch on, of course, the changes and then the dynamics that are incorporated within not only the U.S.-Turkey relationship, but NATO. And as you mentioned, you know, staying apolitical, but recognizing the changes that we have seen in the past few years in the Black Sea region and the momentum we can continue to see with perhaps increased collaboration between the U.S. and, and, and Turkish forces there. So I look forward to uh, continue to this. This feels like a brainstorming session and it, it's a good one. So I want to hear, though, from any potential uh, uh, changes in the in the conversation we've heard thus far from Professor Iden. Professor Iden, we've talked a lot about uh, the U.S.-Turkey relationship, obviously under NATO, uh, under the changes in the Biden administration. So I want to add in any comments that you have thus far from Ambassador Fried or General Breedlove. But I also want to hear from you and in the Turkish perspective, uh, from your opinion on what you are seeing as what many describe a return to maybe Obama era part two. We've seen a lot of familiar faces and a lot of familiar names. Uh, we've heard them in this conversation today. Is this something that will be more predictable in terms of how uh, President Obama reacted or, or treated, so to speak, the U.S.-Turkey relationship? Or are we going to see a new branch, a new day, a new era under the Biden administration? Yeah, um, let me start with uh, NATO and democracy. Um, I agree. I mean, NATO was uh, and still is an institution for democratic countries and at least democratizing countries. Uh, that's always been the case, but it was never a democracy or democratic institution. It was an institution, the value of NATO was, it made all of us more secure. Right? Its, its job was security uh, uh, providing uh, and, uh, and it, the, it brought countries together which felt threatened from the same source. That was the NATO value of NATO, and I think it still is the value of NATO. Uh, having democracy and the countries, uh, more democratic countries together, of course, is an added bonus because it's easier uh, for similar countries to talk to each other and to cooperate each other. And uh, helping the other countries and the countries, member countries, each other in their democracy as well as in their security is a always added bonus and welcome. But of course, when we start 
talking democracy, most of the people, oh, many people in this part of the world would remember democracy promotion uh, of the United States. And they will immediately react if we start using this terminology, they would immediately react by reminding us about 2003, American democracy promotion in Iraq and the occupation of Iraq and what happened after that. So there is this uh, stigma uh, attached to uh, democracy coming from United States or any other country. And I'm personally, I deal with these issues in many countries and in my own country as well. And I, und I believe that democracy is always better promoted and better supported if it's grown organically within the country. Otherwise, anything that comes from, uh, uh, come from outside doesn't really flourish. Um, so that's, that's that. Uh, having NATO in the, in the center of Turkish-American relations is always and has always been a good idea. Uh, that's because the relationship has been established, was established uh, in a strategic context. Uh, whenever the Turkish-American relations are flourishing or have had flourish in the past, we always had this joint or common strategic vision for the present and for the future. Currently, the problem that we are facing in, in this relationship is that Turkish-American relations has lost its backbone, its strategic backbone. The problem is that uh, we have diverged, both Turks and the Americans diverged in our interest and our, in our threat perceptions. Uh, uh, Turkey has been focusing more and more in its neighborhood and becoming more interested in its neighborhood, focusing more so, and uh, creating more autonomies, or at least wishing to create more autonomy in its neighborhood. And the threats that Turkey is perceiving, at least from a Turkish perspective, is quite different what the United States or rest of the allies are perceiving or facing. So this kind of diversification leads into a, what I would call is a big trap, that is transactionalism. Everybody keep talk, talks about transactionalism and as if it's something, it's very good or something very um, realistic or pragmatic. I see that's a huge problem. As far as Turkey is concerned, we see this problem with the Turkey-EU relations or European relations and Turkey-United States relations. Once you go into that road of transactionalism, then it becomes even less possible to have a backbone of the relationship. Then any kind of small issue would come up and pile up one on another uh, and remain unsolvable because nobody then wants to, uh, to give in, to negotiate or to compromise. Then uh, everybody is just uh, looking for uh, benefiting from one side of the relationship and avoiding giving in on the another side. And that's not a healthy relationship. That has been a problem on Turkish-American relations uh, quite a many of time. So uh, again, the Obama part two, that's too very problematic here. And that creates uh, a question marks, obviously. Uh, um, of course, let me remind you Turkey was the one of the first countries that Obama visited when he became president. Uh, in his first term, the relationship was really flourishing and there were a number of ways of uh, uh, encouraging uh, cooperation and et cetera. The second term, whatever happened, happened. But many of the people identify that policy are coming back. And that, of course, creates, uh, uh, raises a few eyebrows in Turkey, that's for sure. But having said that, looking to the Turkish um, statements, the recent statements from uh, president and other officials, uh, I get the feeling that Turkish state and the officials do understand what's happening uh, in the United States. They are correctly analyzing it and hedging their bets and preparing for a negotiation. And they are also, um, for me, it's hopeful. They are also telling their American counterparts that Turkey is ready to talk seriously, which is very important. This, is, this has not really happened in the last few years. As Ambassador Freight already mentioned, there were times at times that 
uh, America bashing was quite a sport in Turkey uh, for some circles. That has to be accepted, that's for sure. And this has resulted in a, a, a very negative public opinion. I do public opinion surveys myself, and the United States is consistently number one country of as a threat to Turkey. This perception has to be changing, of course, and there is a role for Turkish uh, politicians as well as American politicians. Uh, the, uh, again, uh, Ambassador Fried already mentioned the less than uh, quality response to the coup attempt in 2016. Uh, obviously, that was a mistake, but again, we had the similar mistake just 10 days ago uh, when there was a situation in northern Iraq, 13 Turkish former soldiers who were uh, unarmed uh, uh, and kept by the PKK were killed. And the first announcement by the State Department was, uh, let, let me say, created few question marks. So the problem is the both countries needs to be attuned to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the feelings of the other side. And especially this is more true in, in Turkey because we are in Mediterranean, uh, right? Uh, let's, let's allow us to have more emotions here. Uh, and the United States know this quite a lot. Uh, so they have to be quite careful, both the diplomats of the United States and the presidential, on the presidential level. Uh, the, the Turkish sentimentality is quite important and are behind in various decision-making uh, issues as well. So. Uh, part two, Obama part two is not a good idea, but I don't think uh, that the Biden administration will be Obama part two. Nobody and no two administrations are same and the world has changed quite a lot. We have a different world, we have different problems and we have deeper problems now between United States and Turkey that needs to be dealt with. Uh, if we don't deal with it, then I don't want to speculate what might happen. Thank you, Professor. You, know, you bring up a lot of key points, especially when it comes to the idea you mentioned of transactionalism, this piling of, of where do we go from here? And I, I really appreciate, General Breedlove, your comment of recognizing first what we do have in common, what we do share. And I think that the U.S. and Turkey naturally shares a lot of uh, the similar values and goals uh, in, in terms of cooperation and collaboration. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit here. Uh, we've, we've touched on a lot of different things here. And again, I want to remind our audience, put your questions in the Q&A. We don't have a lot of time, so we're going to try to do our best and maximize it. Uh, Ambassador Freed, I want to turn to Iran. Uh, recently, the Biden administration stated that they would not reverse the, the Trump era sanctions until um, Iran halted its enrichment of uranium. Um, and we still see a lot of push for the return to the nuclear agreement, at least from some of the policymakers thus far that have been tapped to join the Biden administration. So what is your stance or what do you think should be the stance on Iran? Is it uh, you know, continued a tough stance to benefit for regional security, or is there a possibility for a return to some sort of agreement, or is is the hope lost in that sort of sense of where we are moving forward towards containing the threat of Iran mm. in the region? There's no question that the Biden administration wants to change the Trump policy of maximum confrontation which resulted in maxim, maximum noise and little result. They want to come back, they want to find a way back into the JCPOA. This is not easy because as the Trump team was leaving office, they complicated the ability of the United States to rejoin the JCPOA, various piling on various sanctions. So this is not easy. And Iran is not making it easier. The Iranian government is not doing, no, it's behaving as those familiar with it know it likes to behave, which is not always in good faith. But the Biden people do not want to continue the, um, the Trump policies. And by the way, speaking of strategic commonality, <laughs> If you're going to talk about Iran policy, you want to start, you want to also talk to the Turks if you're an American. They have a lot of experience with Iran. Uh, they know the ground. These are smart people. 
the advantage, the purpose of the nuclear deal with Iran is not to make things great between the United States and Iran. That that's putting too much on the JCPOA. The purpose of the JCPOA was to prevent a nuclear armed Iran, full stop. That's like arms control with the Soviet Union. Arms control agreements with the Soviet Union weren't going to make it nice. They were, however, going to help ease the most dangerous aspect of relations, the possibility of thermonuclear war, and allow us to have a, a more secure relationship even as we competed with the Soviets uh, in other areas. And, and you can see what I'm driving at, it's perfectly obvious. Iran is not a benign player in the region, and we need to, to be able to work with allies to, to push back on that, but to do so under circumstances where we are also reducing the, da the nuclear danger. And by the way, I'm not, I've never been to Iran in my life. American diplomats don't go there. Um, not anymore, not for a while. But all the European ambassadors in Tehran used to come to Washington and they always said that there are a lot of Iranians that actually like the United States and want a different kind of Iran, a more democratic-minded Iran, or an Iran getting along with better, playing a more constructive role in the region. And there are a lot of them. That's not the only constituents. That, that's not the only set of opinions in Iran, but it's one important set in which you, there are, there's an audience for a different kind of U.S.-Iranian relationship. You can say that I'm terribly naive, but if there are millions of Iranians who want a different relationship with the United States and a better one, reach out to these people. It's, it, this is not short term, it's long term. Build a relationship with Iranian society, even when you're having a complicated relationship with the government. And I say this as not an expert in Iran, but I've been, I'm old, I've been around a while. So that's the way I would approach things. Sure. Well, certainly not an easy uh, topic of conversation, and, and there are a lot more uh, nuances and details. We could have a whole separate conversation solely on this topic, so I understand that. Uh, General Breedlove, feel free to jump in on anything as it relates to Iran, but I really want to hear from you uh, in, in terms of the Black Sea region. We've discussed it a little bit in this conversation, and obviously it's increased focus and importance. Um, you, you had mentioned previously that our Black Sea allies are growing more insecure by the day due to events like Russia uh, intervening in a number of different regions uh, and really the rise of Russia's influence in general. So what are the, some of the actions that the U.S. can take to help and, and reassure our allies in this region and respond to Russia's actions or increased uh, involvement in the area? So let me be very quick so that we can save some time for questions from the audience. But um, I, I think Right up front, our government is beginning to take steps that I believe are required, and that is a strong public, meaning public U.S. commitment to our allies and our alliance, uh, so that the world understands that the United States knows what its Article 5 commitments are, but even more importantly, what that means is in terms of bilateral commitments to each one of our allies. And so I think for the world to understand that we are uh, a, a part of NATO and will meet our NATO requirements is important. We've already been, talked about the second thing I would suggest, and that is we need to find unity again in the face of our opponent's desires. Russia wants to see this alliance busted up. It wants to drive wedges in between us. It wants to emphasize our differences uh, and, and frankly, Russia wants to see all our democracies drugged down to the level of their democracy. And so we need to recognize these two things and not be shy about it. And we need to out it and we need to attack it publicly. We need to find unity. I think uh, uh, the professor has been wonderfully eloquent on getting after the things that are different amongst us and let's solve it. Let's get to diplomacy and let's move out. And I love the whole idea of it. We got to get away from transactionalism. I, I couldn't agree more. So find that unity because we know Russia wants to divide us 
and they want to drag our democracies down to where there is. And then finally, and this is not a, a ploy to sell American kid. I know one of our greatest leaders in NATO just recently sort of said some words about it's all about America selling American kit. As the SACUR, I was very clear. I wasn't about selling anybody's kit, but I wanted the ability of immaculate interoperability and in some cases interchangeability, which is a whole nother step above interoperability. We need to get after our readiness in um, in NATO. And that includes not only the United States, but our allies and partners. And, and a good, strong leadership position by the four or five leaders, big, nation, big national leaders of NATO to get readiness right, especially in this region, would send a strong message to Russia as it meddles uh, in this part of the world. Thank you, General Breedlove, and certainly I, I think it's an important point to note interoperability, interchangeability, two major differences there that are really, really keen for increased collaboration. But we've got just a little bit of time left, so I'm going to turn to audience questions now and try to combine them uh, in, in some themes here. So Professor Iden, I want to start with you. I have a number of questions here on a topic that we have not discussed yet, but I think uh, would be, I'm curious to hear your perspective on. Um, a number of questions have touched on the issue of Cyprus. Um, there's revived interest to make progress on this issue. Uh, one of the audience members noted the UN Secretary General invited all parties to a conference in Geneva this April. Do you foresee any progress possible on this issue in the Biden era? And what, what might we expect moving forward on uh, making progress on this issue? Professor, apologies. I believe you are muted right now. Thank you. Sorry, that's the... Uh problem of the zooming, zooming nowadays. Um, I'd like to say a few words before about the Black Sea because that's a dear region for myself. I work on Black Sea issues. Um, I, I agree with General, of course, very much that uh, we have to be looking more to the Russia and uh, near uh, outside threats rather than looking to the issues that are dividing us. Russia was the country, well, then it was Soviet Union, of course, that brought us together. Uh, so we should, maybe the Russia today might re-bring us together again. Uh, and I have to mention here that Turkey, even though have been cooperating with Russia or in a, what I would call competitive cooperation mood for, for about 10 years or so, I would like to highlight that Turkey has been the only NATO country really on the ground while cooperating at the same time opposing Russian positions in Syria, in Libya, and to a lesser extent in the Caucasus. So there is something to build there. And if, if the NATO and the United States wishes to develop new policies regarding the Black Sea, there is no Black Sea policy of the West, Western alliance without Turkey, and there cannot be. Definitely. Of course, there, is a, there are differences between Turkey and the Western allies regarding the Black Sea, how to operate in the Black Sea. But nevertheless, in the past, we found a modus operandi how to deal with these issues in this region, and we can refound it. Regarding the Cyprus, that's a, a whole lot of a different ball game, uh, and it needs another webinar. Uh, but I'm not a Cypriot, so it's easier for me to talk about Cyprus. Uh, recently, of course, this has been on the agenda, and it was a Turkish suggestion for some time now, uh, but the, with the Secretary General inviting five parties, uh, including two Cypriot communities, as well as Turkey and Greece, but also uh, United Kingdom after so many years, to the, to the kind of a non-binding talks to see what would happen, whether we could restart the process of negotiations on the island. The problem on the island has been uh, same for some decades now. Uh, the security conscious from the Greek Cypriot side, uh, equality consciousness from Turkish Cypriot side. Uh, the problem is, remains the same. Uh, uh, we came very close to solving it during the Annan plan era and then Kran Montana. But in both cases, 
the Greek Cypriots withdraw in the last minute. Uh, we have to look back what was wrong, why they did withdraw in the last minute and try to solve those problems. Unless we can address to those issues that made them to, to go back uh, after the negotiations, any new negotiation will not be successful. And of course, in the Turkish Cypriot side and in Turkey now, there is a hardening of the position. Uh, it has been like fifth, more than 50 years of negotiations since 1976. Uh, we have been negotiating and talking about Cyprus. And on most of this time, we have been talking on based on the bizonal uh, by, uh, uh, federation, by communal bizonal federation. But it's in the last elections in the northern part of the Cyprus, a new president elected uh, on the promise that he's going to negotiate two-state solution. So it seems there is a kind of a game-changing uh, push from the Turkey and Turkish Cypriot side. Uh, we will see what will happen in this in, in few weeks now, uh, the Secretary General's fact-finding, and we'll see whether there is a ground to restart. Personally, I don't think there is a real ground to restart because since Grand Montana, nothing has really changed on the ground. As, a, uh, as I am a uh, co-coordinator of Greek Turkish Forum. Uh, one of issues that we are dealing frequently is Cyprus, and we, we travel before COVID-19. Of course, we used to travel quite often to Cyprus and talk to the leaders of both communities. Uh, it it seems that there is a, some groundwork needs to be done. Uh, whether the United States come back, well, we haven't seen the United States on the scene quite a many years now. Uh, the U.S. could always uh, have a good input uh, because but they, they could have a good input if and when they have good relationships on both sides. Uh, currently, the perception in Turkey, maybe this is a misperception, but a perception on many people in Turkey is that the United States has been start or has started to favor in Greece. Uh, and this was a... a, a uh, strongly um, encouraged by the uh, outgoing administration, by the Secretary of State of the outgoing administration. Uh, and, and of course, uh, this needs to be corrected uh, with the current administration. And it has to talk to both sides from a position of neutrality, mm -hmm. not from a position of uh, imposing. Let me stop here. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. And in light of time, I want to just make sure we incorporate. There's there's so many great questions. I want to thank our audience. Maybe we'll have to send them to our panelists afterwards and see if we can get some more thoughts here. But uh, Ambassador Fried, I want to turn to you, kind of an elephant in the room that we haven't even touched on at all. But in terms of you know, foreign policy changes in the Biden administration, in terms of increased collaboration, cooperation abroad, do we even have the bandwidth for this considering the threat from the coronavirus? COVID-19 is still really uh, impacting so many here in the United States. We have not seen a great success in the numbers expected with the vaccine rollout, although we are seeing uh, it, that increase in terms of how many people are being vaccinated. So how are we to balance this uh, change, obviously, in what is happening right here on our, in our home front in the United States and, of course, around the world with the coronavirus on top of so many of these issues? that we have discussed throughout this panel? Well, look, I, I'm reasonably optimistic about the world getting out of the pandemic this year. Um, the vaccinations, the, the vaccines work and they work better than most people expected going into this and they're coming online and the US after utterly bungling the early stages of the coronavirus response is doing pretty well. Um, with vaccinations of its population. I think by the end of the year, uh, the United States will be getting out of the pandemic, our economy will be booming, and things will look much different. Europe will be slow, but it will follow. Um, and it doesn't matter, because the foreign policy leadership in the, the Biden administration is going to have to pay attention to all the issues in Turkey uh, among them. Now, who in the team? Um, we don't know who the new Secretary of State, the under, Assistant Secretary of State for Europe is going to be, but the Senior Director for Europe is Amanda Sloat, 
She knows Turkey, she knows Greece, Southeast Europe, the Balkans. So this is not alien territory to her. She's a very smart and knowledge, deeply knowledgeable person. Toria Newland is going to be the number three person in the State Department. Everybody knows Toria, how wicked smart she is, but also thoughtful, a deeply thoughtful and knowledgeable person. And she's worked these issues for a long time, and she's got the scars to prove it. I mean, she knows, I'm not going to put her on the spot by asking her to say it, but she knows about all our mistakes. And that's the only way well, you've blown it a couple of times and you know what that's like. And then you're, you know, once you've been burnt, you try to avoid it. It's a, it's a team that knows, uh, they know the ground. Um, you know, uh, Nancy McEldowney, the vice, pre vice president Harris's national security advisor was ambassador to Bulgaria. Um, the deputy is Phil Gordon. Well, you know who he is. I, he worked on, he was my successor as assistant secretary and he worked on the Middle East. These are people who know Turkey. So they don't have to start from scratch and they don't, be, they don't need their hands held as to the basics. That doesn't make the solutions any easier. But if I were taking notes at this meeting, you know, I'd have a pretty good list of you know, problems to avoid, possibilities for cooperation, and then the question marks. You know, mine is, does Erdogan, does President Erdogan want to make this work? Okay, that's my, I, I, I don't have an answer. Um, but, you know, I'm sensing that there is at least a way to structure a discussion. The, well, the Professor Aiden said it, you know, start talking to the Turks about what drives them crazy. You know, the Kurdish issues. And by the way, early in his, pres in his leadership, Erdogan reached out and made a lot of important constructive moves toward the Kurdish community. You know, it's, it's not, there's something to, to work with. Now, I am an American, therefore I tend to naivete in my optimism, but that's a higher naivete because the American instinct is, until Trump anyway, let's see what we can do that's constructive. And the Biden people are going to approach Turkey in that spirit. And, you know, the question came up, Professor Aiden raised it, you know, is this Obama too? And I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Biden is more invested in American alliances. It's, it's deep in him. And his people are, are experienced. They worked in the Obama administration. They're going to be they're going to have in mind a, a better place for U.S.-Turkish relations. That doesn't mean we're going to get there, but they're not going to be looking to trash things. Certainly. Well, we appreciate any optimism, I think, these days, and I appreciate your thoughts there. <laughs> now, we have time, I think, for one more question. Again, I apologize to our audience. We knew we wouldn't be able to get to all of them, but we will do our best. Maybe if we can coordinate with our speakers post-panel. Uh, now, this question for you, General Breedlove, talks about something we didn't really touch on too much today, but I want to get your, your take on this quickly. Uh, we've, we've seen so far that there is, uh, you know, a removal or, or stepping down of Ambassador James Jeffrey, who worked directly with the ICE. Uh, you know, coordination and uh, we're, we're really diving into not only ISIS, but also the question of what do we do about Syria? I mean, this has been a time and time again question for not only the U.S., but regional partners, Turkey, of course. We can't ignore Turkey's role in, in dealing with the, the developments in Syria for years now. So I want to hear some last minute thoughts from you on ISIS, on Syria, where the Biden administration might be taking this in the direction of, you know, uh, maybe a new envoy or um, a new redirection in the State Department in terms of focusing in on this topic and, and any other thoughts that you'd like to share before we close out. And you are muted. Apologies here. Thank I'll be very brief and because I want to avoid those things that I really don't know about. And I am not clear on where uh, the Biden administration will go. So let me not speculate publicly. But let's, let's just remember some things that are not talked about very often. We still have an issue of some security issues in Syria. But, but if you listen to learned people, this is a humanitarian disaster 
that is beyond all understanding. The, the Turkish people are hosting millions. The Jordanians, the Lebanese, others are hosting mir- millions because of this humanitarian disaster that is in Eastern Europe. And I think that uh, while we, we still want to talk about some of these issues of politics and how we uh, uh, deal with this, I think we got to start looking at some of the re- harsh realities that are staring us in the face and our, the Western world uh, needs to think about this. And some of the people who contributed to this in enabling Bashar al-Assad, they need to be facing up to their culpability and what went on in Syria, and their need to be a part of paying this bill, and I say bill in a large term, uh, a large way, not just money, but this bill of what do we now do with this humanitarian disaster that looms. And our Turkish friends, our Lebanese friends, our Jordanian friends and others, uh, uh, they need some relief from what this has all cost in their countries. And we need to understand the degradation of the security situation in this area and all of, let's just say, all of the black flags that are flying in Syria that are now festering uh, issues for everyone in the region. And so um, I didn't answer your question, but I answered one I I wanted to answer. So there you go. That is perfect. I think that gives us a clear idea of the focus, at least, that we need to take uh, moving forward in this region. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I could have stayed on for hours talking to you, panelists. Uh, I really appreciate your perspective. I know our audience did as well. To our audience, thank you for joining us. I know that we have a lot of unanswered questions, so we'll see what we can do about that and incorporating more next time and increased dynamic conversation. So, Professor Iden, Ambassador Freed, and General Breedlove, thank you for your time. Reminder that this conversation will be posted on our website at www.turkheritage.org if you want to rewind and take some notes as I'm sure I will be doing as well. I feel better about uh, where we are going in this country thanks to great analysis from you all and I appreciate your time. So with that, thank you all. Stay safe and healthy and we look forward to our next conversation. Thank you.